Hello and welcome back to the Loud Girl Talks History podcast where I talk about all things history and basically just gossip about famous dead people. This is part two of the Henry VIII episode where Henry is now looking for his fourth wife. Henry didn't actually remarry until 1540, two years after Jane's death, but that wasn't because of a lack of trying. In the past, people have interpreted Henry's bachelorhood as a testament to his undying love for Jane. In reality, Henry had been searching for a new wife all this time. Henry's two previous wives had been English noblewomen, and it was decided that this time, Henry would go international. Multiple women were considered for the obviously coveted role as Henry's fourth wife. Henry would order Hans Holbein, his royal painter, to visit and paint the woman he was considering to marry so that the paintings could be brought back to him for his approval. So Henry was essentially playing what I can only describe as a form of Tudor Tinder. Swipe left if he didn't like the look of her, swipe right if he did, and most of the time he did swipe right and wanted to go ahead with negotiations. But they never really stuck. But in August 1538, Holbein brought back paintings of the two daughters of the Duke of Cleves, Anne and Amelia. Henry particularly liked the look of Anne. He'd heard good things about her and in October 1539, a full-on year after he first saw the paintings, a marriage treaty between Henry and Anne of Cleves was finalised. She was due to go to England later that year and on the 1st of January 1540, Anne arrived at Bishop's Palace in Rochester, Kent. Now, Henry could not wait to see his fiancée and he went to Rochester to see her in disguise, just like he had done with Catherine all those years ago. Henry went into Anne's apartments to surprise her and get a glimpse of her face and Henry had been catfished. Anne wasn't pretty at all. In fact, Henry was physically repulsed by her. But when I look at the paintings, Anne looks really pretty. Like, she she's no Megan Fox, but I can't see why somebody would be physically repulsed by her. Um, but I wasn't there, so who knows. Henry was furious, though, and instantly blamed Thomas Cromwell, his secretary and chancellor, for singing Anne's praises when, in Henry's opinion, Anne didn't deserve them at all. Disappointed though he was with Anne, Henry had no choice but to marry her. First of all, Anne hadn't done anything wrong other than be ugly. Um, And if Henry refused to marry her, this would really damage Anne's reputation and really embarrass her particularly on the international stage. Secondly, Henry didn't have any allies. King Francis and Holy Roman Emperor Charles were now on frontier terms and the marriage with Anne would strengthen Anglo-German relations and give Henry a really important political ally. So, on the 6th of January, 1540, Henry and Anne were married. But the marriage was not consummated and it was common knowledge at court that Henry wasn't exactly enamoured with his new queen. For a court that was known for its adultery and scandal, Anne seemed incredibly innocent and out of place. There's a story of a conversation that Anne had with some of her ladies-in-waiting in February 1540, so around a month after they had been married. Anne told her ladies that Henry was really lovely and considerate with her when they spent the night together. He held her hand and kissed her before going to bed. And one of the ladies, Lady Edgecombe, basically said, what's going on? I think you're still a virgin. Anne laughed that off and said, how can I be a virgin if I sleep with a king every night? And that prompted another lady, Lady Rutland, to say, there's got to be more than you just sleeping next to the king for you to give Edward a younger brother. Bless her, Anne thought that literally sleeping next to Henry in the bed was enough for her to have done her duty and somehow, by osmosis maybe, she might get pregnant. But very quickly, Henry started to get the ball rolling on seeking a divorce from Anne. Henry's grounds for divorce were based on two arguments. Number one, Henry's lack of consent, because he didn't 
or couldn't consummate the marriage and number two Anne's lack of consent because she had a pre-contract of marriage to someone else. On the 27th of June 1540 Henry sent Anne away from court to Richmond saying that it was for her health when in reality it was so that he could sort out the annulment of their marriage. Anne whether she knew of Henry's intentions or not went to Richmond without any fuss. On the 7th of July, with Anne away, Henry ordered the clergy to investigate the validity of his marriage, and two days later, Henry and Anne's marriage was found null and void. No surprises there. The Privy Council visited Anne in Richmond to tell her that her marriage had been annulled, and from then on, she would have the title of the King's sister, she would own three houses, and have an income of £4,000 a year, and that's just over £1.5 million in 2017 money. Anne very graciously wrote to Henry saying that she knew that she owed Henry, that she wouldn't oppose him in any way or for her family and that she would allow Henry to see any letters that she'd received from abroad. After her annulment, Anne enjoyed English life to the fullest. She was living her best life. She adopted English fashions and food. She played hostess to guests from court and pursued the hobbies that she wanted to. She became really good friends with Henry's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, and it's generally accepted that out of all the wives, it was Anne of Cleves who was the one who got the best deal. And I would agree, she absolutely finessed Henry. Anne didn't have to sleep with Henry beyond physically just sleeping next to him. She was a millionaire, and now that Anne wasn't Henry's wife, she couldn't be beheaded. In fact, Anne outlived all of Henry's wives and Henry himself. Even before Henry had sought annulment from his marriage to Anne, he was seriously pursuing a girl at court, Catherine Howard, who was 15 at the time. Meanwhile, Henry was now in his 50s. He was obese and his waist was around 54 inches he couldn't walk sometimes because of the abscess on his leg and that abscess gave henry continual grief it was always oozing pus and it had to be dressed daily and it frankly stank but in the same month that henry annulled his marriage to anne he married the young catherine howard at oatland's palace in surrey catherine was part of the howard family a cousin to henry's second wife anne boleyn and One of the main reasons that Henry was so attracted to Catherine was that she was so vivacious and seemingly so innocent. As Queen, Catherine Howard took on the motto, no other will than his, which we will see as being very ironic. On the same day as his wedding with Catherine, Thomas Cromwell, Henry's former chief minister, was executed for treason and heresy. Cromwell did have Protestant leanings, but it was really the work of his political enemies plotting against him, including the Duke of Norfolk, that led to his downfall. Anyway, love seemed to give Henry a new lease of life. He would wake up between five and six, he would hunt until ten, and moved from place to place around the countryside. Henry absolutely spoiled Catherine with affection and gifts. Catherine was given Thomas Cromwell's old lands, a household of her own, and lots and lots of jewellery. She made friends with Henry's now sister, Anne of Cleves, and brought her to court where she, Henry and Anne dined together. I mean, what a family dinner. In February 1541, though, Henry's health started declining. His leg was causing him immense pain that led him to be essentially chair-bound. And for someone who loved going hunting and hawking and jousting, all of those active hobbies that he had, he was really depressed. Henry shut himself inside Hampton Court, away from everyone, even Catherine. But in mid-March, Henry's leg seemed to have recovered a little and he announced in April that he would go on a progress to the north of England, which he had never visited before. That progress would be a grand affair. There were thousands of horses, archers, artillery, counsellors and courtiers and it was a very intentional move. The point of a progress is for the general public to see the king and to see him in all of his splendour and majesty. Henry heard the locals complaints on his progress and received the people who had rebelled against him years ago um, in the north of England. One member of the group made a speech on behalf of all the rebels confessing their guilt and begging Henry's pardon, which must have really stroked Henry's ego. 
While he was up north as well, Henry was meant to meet James V of Scotland in York. He arrived on the 18th of September, waited for nine days, but then realised that James V wasn't coming. He'd been stood up by his nephew. So Henry left York on the 29th of September and returned back home to his world turned upside down. His four-year-old son, precious Prince Edward, was ill with Quarton fever, a form of malaria. A letter had come from Cleves suggesting that Anne be returned to the Duke and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, brought Henry written proof of his wife, Queen Catherine's, misconduct before her marriage to Henry. While Henry was away on progress to the north of England, a certain John Lascelles approached Archbishop Cromwell, saying that he had reason to believe that there were certain things that he knew about Catherine's past that would have serious consequences for her marriage with the king. More specifically, it was to do with Catherine's time in the household of the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. Cranmer, knowing Henry's temper and his track record of executing the people he didn't particularly like, had to tread carefully. First of all, he summoned Mary Hall, Lascelles' sister, who had been in the Dowager Duchess's household at the same time as Catherine. She told Cranmer that it was common knowledge that Catherine had been romantically involved with her music teacher, Henry Mannix, and with Francis Derham. What was even more worrying for Catherine, though, was the fact that Francis Derham had since been installed in her household as her secretary. So, when Henry came back to London, Cranmer gave him a letter of what he found and gave it to him. Henry was shocked. He summoned Cranmer and demanded an explanation, at which point he ordered Cranmer to get to the bottom of the story and ordered Catherine to be confined in her apartments until she was found innocent. At that point in time, it seemed like Henry was willing to forgive Catherine and confident that she'd be found innocent. In fact, Henry didn't actually believe the accusations against his wife at first. For me, I feel like he went through the seven stages of grief in lightning time. At first, he was in denial, refused to believe the accusations. And then, as his advisors started persuading Henry and he started accepting the allegations against Catherine, the second stage kicked in, pain and guilt. He got so unbelievably angry, started threatening Catherine with violence and then came the depression. Henry started crying, saying how unlucky he was at having met such ill-conditioned wives, never thinking that he might be the toxic one. Oh, it can't be him. Then the upward turn. Henry found solace and comfort in doing what he loved most, hunting. Meanwhile, a full-blown investigation began against Catherine and her past. Cranmer visited Catherine to get a confession out of her, but by that time, Catherine was so hysterical you couldn't reason with her. She tried to leave her apartment and reach Henry to plead with him while he was at prayer, but she was quickly caught and just taken back to her apartment, kicking and screaming. Eventually, Catherine made a kind of confession where she tried putting all the blame on everyone else. She claimed that Francis Derham had raped her and that whilst he had proposed to her multiple times, she had never accepted. Cranmer, though, stated that he believed that Queen Catherine and Francis Derham had a pre-contract of marriage. Catherine's confession to her detriment, also included an account of her last conversation with Frances Derham, where she alleged that Derham asked if the rumour of her marrying Thomas Culpepper, a favourite of King Henry, was true, to which she said no. This was enough to spark Cranmer's suspicions, and Henry gave him further permission to investigate and interrogate Derham and Culpepper, among others. Then everything just fell apart for Catherine. Lady Rochford, the widow sister-in-law of Anne Boleyn's brother, had been a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine. She testified that Catherine was having a full-blown affair with Thomas Culpepper, at the same time incriminating herself for helping. Love letters were also discovered from Catherine to Culpepper, where she signed off with, yours as long as life endures, Catherine. Why did Culpepper not burn the letters as soon as he read them. Subsequently, though, Francis Derham was found guilty of joining Catherine's household with quote-unquote ill intent and was marked a traitor for imagining that they could restart their childhood affair while Catherine was married to Henry. Thomas Culpepper was found guilty of inciting Catherine to adultery. They were both sentenced to execution and to suffer a traitor's death, where they would be hanged drawn and quartered which is probably one of the worst ways to go it's just three executions in one 
but later the sentence for Culpepper was lowered to a simple old-fashioned beheading, which... Out of the two, I'd much rather have a beheading. Catherine Howard was also found guilty of treason for committing adultery against Henry, and she was sentenced to execution, along with Lady Rochford, for essentially aiding and abetting the adulterous affair between Queen Catherine and Thomas Culpepper. On the 13th of February, 1542, Catherine Howard was beheaded on Tower Green, the exact same site where her cousin Anne Boleyn died years ago. Fun fact, kind of. The day before, Catherine requested that the block with which she would be beheaded would be brought to her prison cell so that she could practice putting her head against the block and for her not to embarrass herself when she was actually being executed. After Catherine's execution, Henry threw himself into government and state affairs. There was trouble brewing specifically in Scotland. Henry had been trying to persuade James V to distance Scotland from the Roman Catholic Church and align itself more closely to England. James, though, wouldn't agree. In mid-September 1542, English representatives presented the Scottish representatives with a list of heavy demands. The Scottish were taking too long to respond, and so an English army raided a Scottish town called Kelso. Rather than submitting James into obedience, though, this riled James up. He appealed to Rome and his international allies for aid to prepare a counterattack. On the 23rd of November 1542, a Scottish army fought the English in what became known as the Battle of Solway Moss. This led to a massive loss for Scotland, with thousands of Scotsmen either imprisoned or drowned in the river. Three weeks later, James suddenly died, and this left his daughter Mary next in line for the Scottish throne. He was only a week old. This was great news for Henry. He could use James's death and his victory at Solway Moss for his political advantage, and he wanted to use Mary to unite the English and Scottish throne by marrying her to his son, Edward. Henry released the prisoners that were captured at Solway Moss, but made them promise that they would help Henry obtain control of Scotland's affairs and arrange for a betrothal between Mary and Edward. Essentially, they'd be Henry's men in Scotland. As a one-week-old, Mary can talk, let alone run the Scottish kingdom. So on the 3rd of January 1543, the Earl of Arran was proclaimed Governor of Scotland. However, this wasn't such a big deal for Henry at the time because he still thought that he could control Scotland through the prisoners that he had made swear to work for the English. Henry started to negotiate a treaty with Scotland and in February, a three-month truce was concluded between England and Scotland. In July, at Greenwich, Scottish ambassadors finalised a peace treaty with England and a treaty of marriage between Edward and Mary. Henry had always demanded that Mary be delivered to England, but the Scottish just flat out refused this and had their own way, really. In September, Henry's hopes and dreams for conquering Scotland came crashing down before him. The Earl of Arran had betrayed Henry. He had defected and placed Scotland under papal protection. In December, Scottish Parliament annulled the treaties with England that had been concluded five months previously. Later on that month, all former treaties between Scotland and France had been renewed. Given that England and France were not on good terms at that time, this was worrying news for Henry. In retaliation to all of these events, England declared war against Scotland. Actual military engagements didn't actually take place until 1544. In May, Edward Seymour, the older brother of the deceased Queen Jane, and the English army travelled to Edinburgh, where they sacked and burned the city. And this marked the first major conflict in an eight-year war between England and Scotland, which would continue until 1551, years after Henry had died. Scotland was not the only country that Henry wanted to pick a fight with. Henry had wanted to invade France in 1543, but because England was caught up in its war with Scotland, that wasn't really achievable. Still, Henry laid down the foundations in anticipation of waging war against France. In February 1543, Henry agreed a new treaty with our old friend, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles. Then, in June, Henry delivered an ultimatum to the French ambassador, threatening war in 20 days unless they met essentially unreasonable and impossible conditions. Then there were some small battles in 1543, but it was only when Henry went to Calais in July 1544 that major events started unfolding. 
On the 19th of July 1544, the Anglo-Imperial army lay Bologna under siege, and on the 18th of September, the siege was finally successful. Henry entered Bologna in triumph and stayed there for 12 days before going back home to England. But Bologna was achieved at a great cost, both in terms of men and money, for Henry and Charles. The pressure that Charles felt from the losses that he suffered caused him to make peace with France and end the fighting. Back in England, Henry also agreed to negotiate with France and appoint people to begin talks at Calais. However, neither side could come to any agreement, and the French representatives ultimately left without any peace treaty agreed between the two sides. So, Henry had now lost an ally in war in Charles and now had to pursue war against France alone. There was some minor fighting, but by summer 1546, Henry and Francis agreed to a peace treaty, ending the war between England and France. Henry also agreed that England would not go to war with Scotland unless they broke the peace. They also agreed that Bologna would be returned to France in eight years' time at an eye-watering cost of two million crowns. While all this fighting was going down, though, Henry still found time for his love life. In 1543, Henry had his eye on the 31-year-old Catherine Parr. Catherine Parr had already been married and widowed twice and was a stepmother to her husband's children. When her second husband, John Neville, Lord Latimer, passed away in 1543, it seemed that she would marry Thomas Seymour, Jane Seymour's brother. Catherine had certainly fallen in love with his charm and gentlemanliness. Henry knew, and he didn't care. Whatever Henry wants, Henry will usually get. He started doing what he'd always done with the woman he pursued and started lavishing Catherine with gifts. Eustace Chapuis wrote that Henry would do this sad puppy dog routine where he'd be really sad, pensive and sighing when she was around him and that if only Catherine paid him some attention, he wouldn't be lonely anymore. For Catherine, she couldn't exactly say no to Henry's advances, and so Henry and Catherine were married on the 12th of July, 1543, with Anne of Cleves, Henry's ex-wife and now sister, in attendance. Catherine, in many ways, was the perfect wife for Henry at this stage in his life. He was older now, and so was Catherine in comparison to the wives that Henry had had. She was intelligent, calm, likeable and educated she's certainly my favorite wife but Catherine was already an experienced stepmother as well so she could take care of the three royal children Catherine took care of Elizabeth and Edward's education and she struck up a good friendship with Mary when Henry's leg started playing up in January 1544 he was in a lot of pain and all the while Catherine remained by Henry's side On the 7th of February 1544, Parliament passed a third Act of Succession, which restored Mary and Elizabeth to the line of succession, only after Edward, of course. Catherine used her position as Queen to be a positive influence and even wrote books, which was almost unheard of for women of that age. In November 1545, Catherine published a collection of prayers and meditations. She also wrote a book called The Lamentations of a Sinner in Autumn 1546, which was published in November 1547. In that book, though, Rather than being somewhat of a proto-feminist, Catherine espoused more conventional views. She said that women should learn to be obedient to their husbands, to keep silent in the congregation and to learn of their husbands at home. But she didn't exactly take her own advice. Catherine really enjoyed debating with Henry about topics such as religion and theology, and she was a secret Protestant. A lot of people assume that when Henry broke from the Roman Catholic Church, that was a point when England became a Protestant nation. But it was only in his son Edward's reign that England became officially Protestant. The Tudor England under Henry VIII was still very Catholic. This debating with Henry about things like religion and theology soon got Catherine into a spot of trouble. Because within England, there were broad religious factions, the ones who leant towards the more traditional Catholic traditions and the ones who supported religious reform. As I said before, Catherine was a secret Protestant, and if this was found out, she'd be guilty of heresy, which was a crime that could land someone capital punishment at the time. Catherine and Henry were together one evening, when Catherine had debated with Henry about 
religion and theology as she usually did, urging him to push forward with religious reform in England. Henry got quite annoyed at what he viewed as Catherine's outspokenness and lecturing, saying after she'd left, much to my comfort to come in mine old age to be taught by my wife. Bishop Gardner then took the opportunity to plant a seed in Henry's mind that Catherine could have heretical leanings. After speaking with Bishop Gardner for some time, Henry allowed him to draw up certain articles against her and even signed them. Henry also confided to a Dr Wendy another time about his complaints and the plot against Catherine, but swore him to secrecy. By some miracle, this bill of articles that had been drawn up against Catherine found their way to Catherine herself. When Catherine saw this bill and saw that it had been signed by Henry himself, she understandably started panicking. Catherine just fell apart and started screaming and crying. And when Henry heard that Catherine was unwell, he sent doctors to attend to her, including Dr Wendy. Even though he was sworn to secrecy, Dr Wendy told Catherine everything he knew and what the king had told him. Now, Catherine had to act and quickly. She immediately ordered her ladies to get rid of any forbidden books that they owned. The following evening, Catherine went to Henry's chambers, where Henry brought up the subject of religion to sort of test the waters. Catherine used this opportunity to play the obedient wife, giving answers that she knew Henry wanted to hear. She said that she only talked about religion with Henry to help ease the pain in his leg and to learn from him. Catherine said... I am but a woman, with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of my sex. Therefore, in all matters of doubt and difficulty, I must refer myself to your majesty's better judgment. And this speech was enough for Henry, and he said, Is it so, sweetheart? Then we're perfect friends as ever at any time heretofore. Now, Catherine was safe and out of the woods. But not everybody heard the news. The next day, Catherine and Henry were taking a walk around the palace gardens. Lord Chancellor Riosley, along with 40 of the King's Guards, interrupted them with the aim of arresting Catherine and three of her ladies. Henry just started yelling at him, shouting, Knave, arrant knave, beast, fool. And the Lord Chancellor had to walk away with his tail between his legs. It was crystal clear that Catherine's position was incredibly secure. Catherine wasn't an idiot either. She used this close call as a lesson and from then on she focused on correspondence with scholars, furthering her intellectual passions and charities and ensuring that her stepchildren had a good education, essentially just staying out of all matters of politics and religion. In Henry's final years, his health was seriously failing him. Henry's ulcer kept flaring up and he would suffer from fever on and off. Henry could barely walk, two chairs had to be made so that he could be carried around the palace. On the 30th of December 1546, Henry dictated his will where he assigned the young Prince Edward as his heir. He said his goodbyes to his wife Catherine and daughter Mary in January 1547 and on the 20th of January 1547, at 55 years old, King Henry VIII passed away. And that concludes the life of Henry VIII. I feel like Henry VIII is very easily caricatured in history as the English king who was a slave to his desires, spending money frivolously and chopping off his wives' and ministers' heads, disposing of people when he no longer wanted them in his life. Henry was certainly capable of being extremely cruel when he put his mind to it, which was definitely facilitated by the people and resources that he had available to him as a king. However, Henry VIII is probably one of the most recognisable kings in English royal history, and the actions during his reign continue to affect us today. From Henry's break with the Roman Catholic Church, Queen Elizabeth II is still known as the head of the English Church. His daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, particularly Elizabeth, would have long successful reigns as queens in their own right. But that was the end of the podcast on my first subject, Henry VIII. If you enjoyed the episode, subscribe, leave a review and like, and I'll see you whenever I next post.